Good evening. And thank you all for taking the time to be with us for this wonderful awards event that we couldn't be more excited about. I am so grateful to call tonight's winners fellow alumni, and I appreciate all that they have done for public service with their careers so far. I know there are even more achievements to come for these individuals, so we'll be keeping up with them as they continue to do great work. I would like to introduce the Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Angela Evans. She joined the school as a clinical professor of the practice of public policy after 40 years in public service to the U.S. Congress and became dean in 2016. Since then, she has been pushing the school to achieve higher national rankings, bringing on diverse new faculty that expand the scope of policy topics the school is known for, and she has been working to make attending LBJ more accessible for students who come from fewer advantages compared to typical grad students. The alumni board is looking forward to working with her on the upcoming 50th anniversary event, as well as other exciting endeavors. It is my pleasure to introduce Dean Evans. Hi, everybody. Hello. Isn't this great? Yes. Yeah, this is what we all, it just gives us so much energy. I am so, so pleased to be here. And Lauren, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the introduction, and I congratulate Lauren. Uh, she assumed this position today. So we had to switch over and realize that. Yay. And I also want to thank our alum, our fabulous, fabulous alum, all of you who are in this room. Uh, thank you so much for the support of the school, uh, the energy you bring to, um, to all of us throughout these years. And as we're going into the 50th year of the school, um, I've gotten to know more and more of you, and every, it's just amazing the spread and the depth of our alums. So I'll give each other a great hand. And I, want to, and I want to recognize someone who's extraordinarily special to me and special to the school, Dean Max Sherman. <laughs> For those of you who can't see him, he's sitting at this table, and he's, he's I'm telling you, he's a remarkable human being. Uh, he's been, uh, he was dean at the LBJ School from 1983 to 1997, the longest serving dean. Uh, he's made careers. He's been super, super supportive of me. He's been a friend, a colleague, a mentor. Uh, and he's worked tirelessly throughout the years uh, to continue to make this school what it is and to bring the word of how great this school is to the outside world. He's an amazing man. And he has been one of the biggest supporters of Ms. Abrams, Stacy Abrams. Uh, he's one of the reasons why we have Stacy as an alum. It's Max. Yeah. Woo, Max! <laughs> I also want to, if there's other uh, alum who've been awarded outstanding alum, if you're here, can you just <laughs> raise your hand? There's Laura. There we go. Here we are. I have to tell you, it's an honor. Uh, today we were talking about it, and somebody asked me, you know, what do you think about the LBJ School in terms of your career? I have to say this is the best thing that's ever happened to me, uh, except for my husband, Gary, and my kids. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, it's really an honor to serve in uh, this institution. Uh, it's a place where we believe in the power of courage. We believe in the art of dialogue. We believe in the force of an informed citizenry and an engaged citizenry. And by God, we believe in the potential of democracy in this school. I sometimes, um, I sometimes wonder, you know, I pass by the screens, and here's one, Mr. Johnson behind me. And I often wonder if he were here, what would he be thinking? Um, and I think, and what would he would be feeling? But on this occasion, I think I know what he would be feeling and thinking. Um, we have uh, two unbelievably wonderful individuals, Stacy Abrams and Rudy Mataya. Did I say that correct? Correct? Okay. I, 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 have, I have been mispronouncing his name for a long time. And I quote President Johnson. This is like, I found this quote, and it's like really amazing quote. I hope that the future 
public servants who begin their careers in the school will tomorrow be serving effectively not only in the bureaus and departments of the federal government and the Congress, but also in city halls, in courthouses, in state capitals, not only in Texas, but in every region of the country. Continue to quote, above all, I hope that as they master new skills and disciplines to improve the machinery of government, they will still build their careers of service around a dedication to one of the most cherished principles of our democracy, the greatest good for the greatest number. What could be better, right? <laughs> of our two honorees, and they have purpose, they're purpose driven. They have moved from politics to purpose. They aspire to what unites us, not what divides us. They seek common ground by connecting to the human soul or the essence of us as a people. They have lived the ministry of public service. They have leveraged their extraordinary talent in purpose and in influence. They reflect the better angels of us. They reflect you, our amazing LBJ community, and they reflect what's best in this United States of America. The LBJ School bestows two honors this evening. The 2019 Distinguished Public Service Award to former Democratic nominee for Governor of the State of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. <laughs> and the Rising Leader Award to Pflugerville, and much more, City Council Member and Community Advocate, Rudy Metayer. So let's get going. We will be hearing first from Council Member uh, Rudy, our little buddy here, and I'm so I'm so pleased to introduce him to you today. I, I met him in my office. He came to talk to me about a problem, and from that point forward, he was brave to come to me about a concern he had. Uh, we listened. He listened to me, and he's just been really close to school ever since. He's the son of Haitian immigrants, uh, and he's the first generation in his family to complete higher education earning a BA at the University of Texas, College of Liberal Arts, and Executive Masters in Public Leadership at the LBJ School, and a law degree from Texas Law. As a community advocate, he has spoken and worked on issues ranging from teaching at-risk children, co-authoring an honor code for the University of Texas, helping forge a community policing partnership with local law enforcement and the State Bar of Texas, creating pro bono legal advice clinics for U.S. military veterans. He was also recently named an Outstanding Young Lawyer um, of the Year by the Austin Bar Association and a fellow to the Texas Bar Foundation. He's been recognized numerous times as one of the most influential young professionals, not only in the Austin area, but also in Texas. And I'm telling you, that's pretty remarkable. Texas, Texas and Austin's got a lot of talent. Um, <laughs> Rudy believes that true collaboration among stakeholders is key to keeping Pflugerville the fiscally responsible, economically strong, inclusive, and high quality of life place as it is today. He's married to an amazing wife, Leticia. Yay! And is the dad to three beautiful daughters, Celeste, Arielin, and Brooklyn. We got a couple down here. <laughs> Rudy is a remarkable young man with a beautiful soul, a giving heart, and an infectious smile. I'm proud of the legacy he has already built and look forward to the decades ahead when, Rudy, you're going to be making a lot of people very, very happy and very comfortable in this country. So thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Rudy. <laughs> So, do we have to take a? We have to do the ceremonial oh. thing. <laughs> I can start off by saying this: it feels really good to be home. <laughs> What's amazing about tonight is that I can literally look out in the crowd and see people who have touched my life, not only. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. 
um, by Ugin and Janine Metier. Um, but people who have looked out for me, literally since I stepped foot on the 40 acres, like Mama Bird over here, Brenda Bird. Um, I, you know, can't believe that. You know, you have, you, you have friends for life, and you have someone who's known you since six years old, Brian Sashon, who comes into town just for a specific event to go and see you. I love you for that, brother. Um, and it really does humble you and make you think back about where you've been and what you've done and what you want to do. And here, the biggest thing I'd say is this, is that the University of Texas is so unique because it really does give you a cross-section of folks in the state to come together, learn from each other, collaborate, and truly get to be the best person that you can be. It gives you that opportunity. Now, make no mistake, you know, as a recent Atlanta article, you know, that came out earlier today talked about, there is a, a dark history here regarding bigotry and racism. And, you know, the allowance or disallowance of African American students on here. And the bravery that folks like the precursors came on campus to make sure that I would be able to have a place here. I would be able to make a discernible difference. And I'd be able to matriculate and be the best that I can be. Couple that with the Hopwood decision. And you're thinking about the top 10%. And you're thinking about ways and avenues that continuously the University of Texas has strove to make sure that this university is not just a university of certain segments of society, but all of society in general. That legacy, that heart, that understanding, that commitment, it gets you excited. It makes you proud. And it makes you want to make sure that you have the same thing happen for the generations to come. I feel blessed. I feel completely blessed. You know, I feel that, you know, you have a plan in life, you have an idea of what you want to do, and then God really gets you prepared for what's going to happen to you and work from that. You know, I, you know, you know going back to, I better get back on what the remarks were, excuse me, instead of going off-road with some of these things. I do want to go ahead and say thanks because my parents, this is the first time you've ever been at an event where I've received an award. And it makes a big difference for you to fly in. And be here. I can't tell you how big of a difference it had in my life having a strong Republican mother and a strong Democratic father. <laughs> you can imagine the kitchen debates and everything else that goes on from that as well. But. It allowed for me to have a, a perspective that, you know, sadly, I don't think we do enough in this country. Right before I came over here, I got to speak to a, a, a group of about 60 young people, young professionals, who are going to a program called Leadership Austin, where, in fact, they're going to dive into a lot of the main issues that are happening in the region and trying to find their own path and try to see what they can see with that. And one of the things I made a point to them to know and realize is that take the opportunity to get to know one another. Take the opportunity to go ahead and understand those different viewpoints and ideas and goals. Because in life, we don't do that enough anymore. We don't take the opportunity to go ahead and truly understand what another person's trying to say. We don't truly try to understand that perspective. When someone is telling you their viewpoint, that's their truth. That's the life that they lived. And so if you have something that buttresses against that, of course they're going to be shocked. They're going to say, wait a minute, this is the life I live. I, you can't tell me I'm wrong here. I lived this life. And so if you're telling me the alternative, that blows everything that I've had to learn from that. And we really, truly need to try to understand and reach out to those viewpoints and understand those goals incorporate. Doesn't mean that you have to agree. Doesn't mean at all about that. But you have to understand and not just sympathize, but empathize. And that's what makes you know, places like the LBJ School so vital in our society, so important to have that opportunity to have those kind of discussions. Because guess what? When you matriculate from here, when you leave here, those discussions, those ideas, they're not going anywhere. There's still the same debates and goals and concepts that we're going to have out there in society. And it's important for you to be able to be engaged and equipped 
to go ahead and deal with those things. To not just be quick to cast aspersions, but to make sure that you're talking to folks and understanding a manner in a manner that can go ahead and relate with one another. And you know when you do things like that, good things happen to you. Here's a perfect example. A couple years ago, the wonderful Lucy Baines Johnson decided that she would have a couple of up and rising leaders in the, in the Austin area over her house, just conversation. She wanted to see what was going on, see what her viewpoints are, you know, see everything else is system with that. She had planned that about a month ahead or so. We were really excited because we get to go over there and meet Lucy Baines Johnson, you know, excited to see what happens from there. <laughs> And then Charlottesville happens. And we went to her house the Tuesday following that. And I can't say enough about how carthotic that was, how embracing it was, how emotional it was to be able to sit there and just talk about what we had seen, what was going on in our country, and to think, wait a minute. Have things always been this way? Are they just out in the open right now? Do people agree with these thoughts and ideas? What are we gonna do about that? And that moment and that concept and idea was pivotal to so many of us to be able to just have that bond, to have you speak to us and truly understand that and it made a difference to us. We actually launched several political careers after that. <laughs> <laughs> Including myself, never had a problem myself. <laughs> Everything that we do in life, we have people out there who are su supporters, cheerleaders, people who are truly embracing to see you succeed. I've been lucky because it hasn't just been my wonderful parents. It's been people like Commissioner Trevelyan, working out for me like a big brother. Pastor Parker, Joseph Parker. You know, you, I still remember the first time Bill Powers told me, I, do you know Pastor Parker? I said, what does the pastor have to do anything with law? I was like, wait a minute, I'm very confused about here. Accordingly. And how you just changed my life, your policies and goals with that aspect. Jeremy, I wouldn't be here right now if not for you, Barry Bells, and Craig Peterson. You told me, yes, you have a law degree, Rudy, but you know what? You're destined for bigger things. You're gonna be in the policy realm. You need to go ahead and understand these concepts and ideas, be embraced in the goals and that there, and this is the place to do that. And you were right. At least once. <laughs> My wife, Letitia, my rock, you allow for me to be the best version of me that I can be. And there's nothing in this world I could have done without your support. Love you, sweetie. <laughs> Mama Burt. You watched out for us on campus here. When the, you know, when you had the statues getting egged, we had people defacing MLK. When we had the blackface parties, the flyers on campus saying, don't date black men, they'll give you AIDS. You were there for us. You created a space over there at DDC, and you made a difference for us. I can't thank you enough for your support and your guidance. And we really are truly your children. And I hope we make you proud in your legacy here at the University of Texas. <laughs> well, nothing I said was written. <laughs> but I do want to wrap up in closing to say this. It feels really strange to sit up here and talk about things that you're accomplished when you're really trying to think about how you truly can make a difference in this world and what more you can do. And I'd say that to each and every one of you, look into 
what aspects and goals you truly want. Look at what values that you encourage. Talk to people that are different from <coughs> yourselves. Try to truly understand what the significance that comes from that. They just came out with a new documentary from the great Ken Burns on country music. And one of the best quotes that came from him from that is that, yes, each of us belong to an ethnic group, but we also belong to one specific group, the human race. And we need to get back to that, you know, back to those goals and concepts. And with the vibrancy and the people that I see here at this school, I know they're going to make that happen. And that's the legacy this man has allowed for us to go and encompass over here with that. Thank you, God bless, and I always hook them. Thank you, Rudy. Soon we'll hear from Stacey Abrams, uh, but first let me share with you some of her accomplishments. I mean, I think you all have been following this amazing young woman. Uh, during an interview, she was asked if she saw her nomination at that time as the Democratic candidate for governor of the state of Georgia as history making. How she responded to that question really defined Stacy, and the force she brings to the American political arena. She said, quote, it is not just history for me, it is changing the face of what leadership looks like in America, and I'm excited to be part of that vanguard, end quote. And indeed, not only is she part of that vanguard, she's one of its leaders. Ms. Abrams was the first black woman in the United States history to become a gubernatorial nominee for a major party. And she won more votes. I mean, think about that. That's profound. She won more votes than any other Democrat in Georgia's history. She served 11 years in the Georgia House of Representatives, including seven as minority leader. Again, a vote of confidence. And in 2019, she became the first black woman to deliver the Democratic response to the State of the Union Address. Following her gubernatorial campaign, Ms. Abrams has been focusing her efforts on preventing voter, voter suppression by uh, founding Fair Fight, an organization dedicated to uh, election reform. Today we were talking about being in the arena, the Teddy Roosevelt 1910 speech that he wrote, it's like 18 pages of speech. He has one paragraph in there that talks about being in the arena, and it says, you get in that arena, it matters, you get bloodied, you, get, you fall down, and you get back up. And everybody who doesn't go into the arena has no right to say anything. She epitomizes that. <laughs> Stacy has founded multiple organizations devoted to protecting voter rights, training and hiring young people of color, and tackling social issues at both the state and national levels. She has, including she's got Fair Count, a nonprofit whose aim is to ensure that the 2020 census is fair and accurate. People don't understand how important that is. Her tireless and her fearless work to secure and defend voting rights has energized our nation and our politics. You need a person who epitomizes what we need to be doing, and she's it. Please join me in welcoming Stacey Abrams. I'm going to give this to you because it is going to fall at some point. <laughs> likely on my foot. And then I'll say something inappropriate and this whole thing will be done. <laughs> to Dean Angela Evans, who I may hire to be my PR person. <laughs> to Dean Max Sherman, who let me in and let me out. 
to Lucy Baines Johnson, who flew down to Georgia to remind all of us of the legacy of her father, but most importantly, of the possibility of our nation. Thank you. And to my co-awardee, Mayor Rudy, I'm sorry, I'm promoting you. <laughs> Council member, Rudy Metier. So my little placard over there says I'm the class of 98. And there's a story behind it, because I actually got here in 95. I came to the LBJ school having attended Spelman College, where I went, thank you. <laughs> Spelman, for those who don't know, is a black women's college in Georgia, in Atlanta. It's an amazing school, and there I was pretty cool. I got stuff done, I was president of the student body, I was a big fish in a small pond. And I decided to swim a little upstream and applied for a fellowship that no one in the history of my school had ever won, that no black woman in the history of my state had ever won. But everyone told me if you apply for it, if you work at it, if you can get through Mississippi, which was my home state, you can win. And after a lot of soul searching and prayer, I believed them. I applied and I won in Mississippi. I became the Mississippi nominee for the Rhodes Scholarship. Hold on. <laughs> this did not have a happy ending. <laughs> because you see, I believed them when they told me all you had to do was overcome this major hurdle. If you overcame this hurdle, the rest would be easy. Only I'd forgotten that racism and sexism don't have a timeline and they don't have a geography. And for various reasons, I did not become a Rhodes Scholar. My approach to life, having been raised by Robert and Carolyn Abrams, was when you faced adversity and you were not successful, your first responsibility is to look inside. What could you have done differently? Could you have been better? Did you make a mistake? And my answer to all those things, well, yeah, I could have been better. I didn't make a mistake. I should just kept myself where I was. And so when I was applying to graduate schools during the process of the Rhodes Scholarship, I applied to seven law schools and six grad schools. I also like to lay my odds out pretty far. <laughs> I only picked top schools, but I looked at geography, I looked at ranking, I looked at weather, because I'm from the South, <laughs> and I looked at Ivy League schools, because having gone to Spelman, the Ivy League was what I was told to try for. And I was admitted to Harvard, University to their law school and to their graduate program, to the University of Chicago, to the University of Texas, to a number of schools. But after losing the roads, I decided that I was probably not equipped for these larger opportunities. And despite my admission letters, despite their financial aid, I wanted to figure out what was the safest place I could go to, where I could challenge myself but not challenge myself too much. Where could I? work towards a degree I wanted, but not worry about failing in public. And I wanted to be warm because I hate the North. <laughs> and so I chose the University of Texas. I chose the LBJ School and the University of Texas Law School. You see, I had made the misconception that because it wasn't Harvard that it would be easier. <laughs> My God, was I wrong. <laughs> I decided that it was going to be a safe space for me to just coast, that I wasn't going to have to challenge myself as much, and that if I failed, if I stumbled, they wouldn't notice here. And so I came to the LBJ school, and I met Dean Sherman. I met Bob Wilson, who made me his research assistant. I met Elspeth Rostow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who once told me with great the great patrician air that she had, that I was capable of greatness if only I would bother to show up. <laughs> yes. I listened to Jamie Galbraith explain economics in a way that actually made sense and completely confused me. <laughs> but at the same time, I was wondering about the decision I'd made. Being at the LBJ school, exposed me to ideas and opportunities I'd never imagined. It challenged me to think differently about policy and about the work I wanted to do. It charged me up because of its legacy and its namesake, that my responsibility was larger than any ignominy I may face, and that the work that was begun by the great society remained to be done, because during the first of my days here, 
Barbara Jordan was down the hall. She didn't let first years in her classroom, but she was down the hall. <laughs> But at the same time, I had a dear friend who was the secretary of a fellowship that I'd won in college, uh, the Truman Scholarship. And his name was Louis Blair. He was dear friends with Max Sherman. And Mr. Blair called me on this. And he said, Stacy, why are you at the University of Texas? And he said, if you're there because that is where you want to be, good. But if you're there because you're afraid, I'm ashamed of you and I'm disappointed. Now, by that point, I could admit that I was at the LBJ school because it was the place for me, because it challenged my ideas, but it gave me space to try things. That sometimes you need a little safety in your challenge. Sometimes you need a little bit of a haven to press and test yourself. But at the same time, the Hopwood decision came down. And I went from being one of 100 black students at the University of Texas Law School to being one of eight. And if I figured if I was going to be one of eight black people, I might as well do that at Yale. And so <laughs> I, I applied to the Yale Law School. I didn't think they would let me in, so I wrote this weird essay, and I filled out my paperwork and sent it off. And I mentioned in passing to the administration that I'd made this application, because there had never been a student who went to the University of Texas LBJ School and went somewhere else for law school. Out, to, out of state. Everyone knew I was doing it, and as Lee Bosk reminded me, the day I got in, I may have cursed, and <laughs> I was very excited. I'm like, <laughs> like, I used an expletive and suggested it was odd that they let me in, but I was going to go. <laughs> and then the hammer came down. I was told that I was not permitted to complete my degree if I left Texas, that because of the rules of the state, because of the number of hours I would have to receive while at the LBJ school, that I would have to either for forfeit this degree here or forfeit the opportunity to go to Yale. Now, I come from a family that my mother likes to call the genteel poor. We had no money, but we watched PBS and we read books. <laughs> <laughs> and the opportunity <laughs> to be the first in my family to go to law school, to be the first in my family to go to Yale Law School, was not lost on me. The fact that the Hopwood decision had in the state of Texas diminished the possibilities for so many made me angry about that law school and made me burn to show them. And so I decided to go to Yale, but by the time I was doing that, I had a problem. I was in love with the LBJ school. I was in love with professors who saw their students not as charges, but as opportunities for greatness. I was in love with a place that believed that the work of the great society could be made whole and made manifest in their lifetime. I was surrounded by people who didn't like each other all the time <laughs> and were not ashamed of saying so, <laughs> but who did so with respect and with credibility and with numbers and with a deep admiration for the possibility. And I did not want to lose the opportunity to say that I was a graduate of the LBJ School. But part of growing up is you have to make tough choices, and I chose to go to Yale. I said goodbye to Dean Sherman, who had appointed me to committees, who explained to, to Dean Rostow that I wasn't as shiftless as I seemed, uh, <laughs> who believed in my possibility and encouraged me to take that opportunity. And so I left the environs of Austin and went to that cold hell that is New Haven. <laughs> and I began my time there. And a few months into my second year, a letter appeared. And it was, it was a FedEx. And I opened this letter, and it was from Max Sherman. And in it, he told me that he was going to be retiring from the LBJ school in 1997. And he said, if you can get your stuff done, if you can write a thesis, and if you can arrange to take these two courses, I will make certain that you receive a degree from the LBJ School. And so with the help of Bob Wilson and Pat Wong, I wrote a thesis on the operational dissonance of the unrelated business income tax exemption that I'm certain only Pat Wong read. <laughs> I took a stats course 
at Yale that was really hard. <laughs> I took the courses I needed to take and I submitted my information and I became a graduate of the LBJ School in 1998. And what I owe to Dean Sherman, what I owe to this, this school is more than my gratitude for this degree. What I owe is a sense of purpose that allowed me to stand for office and once again not succeed. You see, I tested myself with the roads and not quite made it. I tested myself here at the LBJ School. I tested myself again and again. And what I learned again and again is that what we are called to do is not to be the victors. We are called to be the valiant. We are called to be the ones who will try again and again, knowing that success is not guaranteed, but knowing that the requirement is that we fight anyway. That yes, I am not the governor of, te of Texas or of Georgia. <laughs> and I'm only gonna try for one, maybe again. But I know that the legacy created by Lyndon Baines Johnson, a complicated legacy that believed in grace and evolution and redemption, that believed in the perfection of humanity, if not the perfection of the human, that believed in the possibility of now and the promise of tomorrow, that that lives here in this space. That when I did not become governor, my job was not to wallow or to weep, my job was not to do the dance of concession that says that everything was okay. My job was to do what LBJ said we do, and that is call out wrong and demand right and fight for justice. That is what we do. And I stand here before you looking at a quote that says, if the society today allows wrongs to go unchallenged, the impression is created that those wrongs have the approval of the majority, and voter suppression does not have the approval of the majority because the majority has been silenced. And whether it is the words of Barbara Jordan or the namesake of Lyndon Baines Johnson, we are all inheritors of an extraordinary and remarkable covenant. And that is that each day when we ply our trade, whether we are in the bureaucracy or in the political space, or whether we've escaped altogether and gone to academia, <laughs> that our responsibility remains core and unchallenged. And that is that we do right, that we fight for justice, and that we serve humanity. I paraphrase Lyndon Johnson because he shouldn't have just said man. <laughs> but I quote his ethic and his ethos when I say that this is a college, and I mean small c college, a place of learning, a place of erudition, but also a place of grace that will lead us all forward. And I thank you for having me among you. <laughs> That was incredible. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. I hope you are as inspired by Ms. Abrams and Mr. Mataya as I am. That was just so wonderful. Uh, be sure to stay in touch through Alumni Fire and the LBJ events page at uh, lbjutexas.edu slash events. <laughs> uh, and we hope to see everyone at the tailgate here in the breezeway uh, tomorrow at 2.30. You can find the details and purchase tickets ahead of time on the LBJ Great Tailgate Society Facebook page. And uh, for those who aren't going to the game, we'll have an official alumni watch party at Haymaker uh, immediately following the tailgate. So uh, just want to thank you again and get home safely. This was a wonderful <coughs> evening, and we're so grateful to share it with everybody. Thank you.